We've received new economic data in the past few days, and the results were mixed. I'm your host, Andrew Brill. Let's see what our experts had to say this week. Christopher Mullen, the founder and CIO of the Technical Traders, took a look at the broader macro picture and how things are unfolding behind the scenes. He feels the market has room to grow. He took a look at the oil market and how conflicts around the globe are affecting it and analyzed uranium with a detailed chart. Before we start looking at the charts, maybe you can just give us your view of the big macro picture. Sure. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, James. Uh, overall, like when I look at the big macro picture, kind of the overall view of what's going on, I, I, I believe we are getting closer and closer to a major market reset. Uh, but as you just stated, the market is still in a very strong uptrend. In fact, that August shakeout that you and I talked about and we're experiencing in our last talk uh, and the volatility that we've seen has really kind of cleansed the market. When the market has a sharp pullback and a pause, a couple month pause like we've just seen across the board, it re-energizes the market that could have another push higher. So I do think overall equities have another three to 8% upside on the SP 500 or the NASDAQ uh, if this traction continues to uh, follow suit. But in the big picture, I do feel like things are starting to slow. I think we're seeing you know, unemployment slowly creeping up, although it did dip a little bit um, uh, last week, but we're seeing delinquencies on credit cards. Cards are maxed out and they're, they're going delinquent. I think it's one of the largest uh, times ever we've seen maxed out credit cards that are delinquent. A lot of people will just have small, small amounts of debt and just not wanna pay it, but cards are maxed out. We've got residential, commercial, real estate, mortgages are starting to default and take off. We've got a lot of defaults starting to happen actually in the multifamily, which is like not a good sign at all because that's the most affordable to build, has the most potential. So there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes unfolding, telling us that, you know, people are running out of money. Um, people aren't finishing projects. Everything's costing more. And we're seeing like leisure and activities as we've seen some of the biggest cuts in that area. People just aren't spending the same amount of money as they used to travel. Um, you know, all kinds of uh, discretionary products are, are coming to a grinding halt. And uh, we've seen the biggest layoffs in that space. So when people start closing their wallets and tightening up, uh, it's going to take a few months, a quarter or so, but it'll ripple through. And we're seeing, you know, cut in manufacturing, which manufacturing is like three or four month lead time. They're not getting the orders from the stores, so they're laying off employees. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff coming down that by the end of this year, I think we could be like, you know, getting very very weak in terms of recession being a lot clearer um, down the road. So that'll that'll tip the scales and make people even more nervous. And it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think we'll see equities and things sell off and uh, go from there. So I'm short term bullish, but longer term, I, I see the music coming to an end. OK, so why don't we start looking at charts and why don't we take a look at the S&P to begin with? It's up 20 percent on the year. And it's currently trading around 5,700. You think there's another three to four percent upside? Yeah, I think there's there's still some pretty good upside. I like to use Fibonacci extension as a technical trader, which gauges how much momentum there is. And this big correction that we saw back uh, July, August, uh, if we if we use a Fibonacci extension, which I find is the most accurate tool to project upside targets. Uh, I only use two measurements on this. I use a 618, so meaning this rally and this pullback, if the market rallies 61% of this first leg here and takes a pause, which it has, we almost always go up and hit this 100% measured move. So there's about 4% upside here on the SP500 uh, to the upside. The NASDAQ has about an 8% upside potential. Uh, based on its chart pattern, but is this whole consolidation right through here where the VIX spiked like 175%, we saw all kinds of fear. It, when the market has one of these fear-driven events, it cleanses the market. Anybody who's, who's going to get shaken out got shaken out. That's what all of these are. This one isn't quite as severe, but it led to the next major leg up. And of course, this is another one of these little pauses. The smaller they are, the smaller the potential upside. But when we have one of these big ones, it can push the markets to have a pretty big move. Um, but we're definitely seeing some warning signs. La all last week, we saw distribution selling on the indexes, meaning every time the market drifted higher on light volume, we'd see heavy volume step in and hammer the price. There's some big institutions lightening their portfolios, dumping billions of dollars into the market. 
uh, but they're doing it in a controlled way. The market drifts a little higher to resistance. They they unload, you know, a few hundred million or a billion dollars worth, drive the market back down, then they stop selling. They let the market repeat that. And we saw that all last week. So these are early warning signs that these huge institutions are starting to lighten their portfolios, reduce exposure, uh, and they take months to unload portfolios. So all it is is an early warning sign, along with other things, gold and silver and miners are telling us that, um, you know, I think we're very close to some type of black swan event, to a recession, to a big stock market reset. Uh, obviously, oil taking off, all these things we'll touch on um, are leading to, I think, a bigger bearish picture for the economy and the equities markets. Yeah, well, to your point, it's going to be interesting to see. We're going to start seeing uh, Q3 numbers coming out here in earnest in the next couple of weeks. The big first big one is JP Morgan at the end of this week. And it's going to be interesting to see the narrative coming out of these companies just in terms of the consumer and the health of the consumer. So yeah. just to recap here, your short term target on the S&P would be 6,000 by the yeah. end of the year. Yeah, roughly about 6,000. Yep. And why don't we move over to the NASDAQ now and Let's get your thoughts on that. It's also up 20% on the year, but it's not making new highs like the S&P is. Yeah, so it's struggling a little bit more. Uh, obviously, everybody, the mass is always piled into the big Magnificent Seven. Whatever is in the news and moving, for some reason, the masses all want to own it. Uh, and so when the market starts to correct, they're all this, they all dump the same stocks. So the NASDAQ really got hit and people are nervous. We saw like a 20 plus percent drop in the markets and NVIDIA. Uh, but we have seen, you know, a rally. We had a pullback and now we're, we're, we're playing around this 618 level and it's got about enough to go up to about 21,000 or pretty much a double top uh, for the Nas for the NASDAQ going forward. So there is still upside potential, but definitely had, there's been some damage done. People who were involved in the Magnificent Seven um, really went for a roller coaster ride and now they're a little gun shy. And that's why we're not seeing it go high. Uh, making new highs like the SP 500. It's just people are nervous and uh, they're worried that it's going to be another collapse. So this is not a good sign. We want to see the tech leading the way because where tech goes is pretty much going to drag the rest of the market with it. Uh, but it's not quite as strong as the overall broad market here. So as you mentioned, one of the big unknowns is inflation. And one of the things that's really been helping us here in the past year is the price of oil. And it's been kind of hovering in between the $70, $80 a barrel. And, um, but recently with the hostilities in the Middle East, it has caught a bit of a, a bid. But what's your take on oil here? Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 bearish on oil. To me, the chart pattern is, you know, we've got a sell off and we've got a pause. And usually this pause or this pennant formation uh, is usually known as a halfway point. And so whatever this first leg down was measures where, you know, the next one should go. So I, I believe we're going to probably see like $40, 45 dollars per barrel at some point, which a lot of people say there's no way. But in reality, we've hit this $40 per barrel a ton of times going going back over the last, you know, 10, 15 years or so. It's not that significant. In fact, we went negative. So, I mean, you can't really argue anything anymore in terms of where price could go. Uh, so I do think that is probably going to be the case. Now, obviously, we have the wild card, the black swan of, you know, the Middle East, you know, World War Three going on and, and bombs start flying, uh, then all bets are off. Oil will probably skyrocket. Gold will probably want to move higher as well. Typically, those two go up in sync during a massive war. Uh, so other than that, I do think most things are stalling out and, and weak. And I'm bearish on oil unless there is, you know, unless bombs start flying around and um, you know, re oil refineries start getting hit. That'll probably completely make oil take off. It's amazing with everything that's going on in the world that oil is hanging in where it is. And you got to wonder if we didn't have these hostilities and we didn't have the war in Ukraine, oil would probably be at 40 or 50 bucks. Yeah. And I think the, I think the world has really changed a lot. I remember back in the Gulf War and all that stuff going on. It, it was such a different time. Now, I mean, when we hear war, we're all I'm picturing are all those tracers across the skies and jets and bombs going off. I mean, that to me is... Like that's obviously what I picture in my head as war. Now it's just like a digital and like, you know, a digital war of zeros and ones and, you know, interviews and people bashing each other and people trading trade, swapping trade policies. Who can buy this? Who can't buy that? 
Uh, so it's really, really different. I think I think if we saw explosions in a big way in terms of refineries on fire and all that stuff, it would probably dramatically change oil. But I think, um, you know, war right now is so it's a, very different, I think. I mean, I'm not in that space. I don't know it, but um, it's just not the same as what we picture back in, you know, back a long time ago when there was like really guns going off and missiles going off. Uh, so if those start to fly, I think oil will do what we're expecting, but I think people don't realize maybe how bad things are because it's all just information and we hear news all the time. So we're all kind of like pretty numb to like, oh, there's another more tension in the Middle East. And I mean, we have, we've heard that forever. So it doesn't really spark huge fear in my opinion. Okay, Chris, I want to ask you about one more metal before we move on and that's uranium. I, in my opinion, I don't think there's another commodity that has a more positive backdrop than what's happening within the nuclear energy sector and uranium. And when you look at the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust or SPOT, what do you think of this chart? Yeah, I mean, this is a really strong chart. Uh, just using Fibonacci extension based off this last level here, we can we can get a gauge of where this could run. This is a super strong looking bull flag pattern. As a, as a technical trader, a, a bull flag pattern is it creates a flag pull, so a move up, and then a flag usually flags in the opposite direction in the wind, flagging downward. And then here's the second half of this move. Should bring us up to 618 level. And then from there, it can run all the way up to 32. So 2650 to, to 3250 um, is the upside potential based on, on this chart. And, and from where that is, that's a 60% upside move, 61 um, potential if this was to unfold. Now, this is the monthly chart. So obviously, this could take very similar to this one, which is a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seven or eight months uh, minus two here. So, you know, in five months, it could potentially run up there. Um, so it does have a very strong chart pattern and uh, it is pointing to higher pricing and uh, see if we can get some traction here. The second largest uranium producer in the world is Cameco. It's based in Canada. Why don't we take a look at that? Yeah, Cameco's got a little bit of volatility. I think uh, the the big sell-off we saw kind of this summer in the overall stock market created a little bit of a pattern I don't like, which is a broadening formation. You got higher highs, lower lows. It's known as a megaphone pattern. Uh, it just means volatility is increasing. It's rallying up, but it's it's to higher highs, but it's also selling off to lower lows. It's a sign of uh, you know indecision, increased volatility. Generally means you're the previous move, which would be this move up, is running out of steam, and eventually, you know, it, it could roll over. So, um, there is there is definitely a, a little bit of weakness in this megaphone pattern. I, it's much better when price consolidates into like a narrowing pattern, so it rallies up and then pauses and then breaks out. Uh, so, increased volatility. Obviously, you need to be aware it's going to can probably continue to be more volatile. So, you have to take smaller positions, manage those. Um, I'm not a huge fan of this chart pattern. I like the other chart we just looked at, uh, the Sprout one, uh, much more than this, uh, just because um, this at any point could sell right back down or it might push up to higher highs. It just doesn't have a very uh, super strong chart pattern. It looks like a sign of kind of exhaustion. Uh, that's not my, my favorite type of pattern. Michael Gayed, portfolio manager of Title Financial Group and publisher of the Lead Lag Report, something you should check out, explained how traditional models may not apply to today's economy. He touched on the debt crisis and feels there is room to grow in AI investing and some other sectors. He also took a look at nuclear power and the future of commodities. Have you seen anything like this before where there, there's been such a, a weird time? You know, we yeah, we did go through COVID. We pumped a, a boatload of money into the economy just to try and keep it moving when people weren't working and things seemed to be at a standstill. But it almost seems like the regular economic models we follow don't touch on any of this. It's like, you know, now economists are like, oh my God, I have to think outside the box. And, you know, when you go to economics class, it's like, no, no, this is the way it works, but it doesn't work that way anymore, does it? Yeah. And actually there have been some interesting posts I've been seeing on X. Um, one, for example, that looks at how the copper to gold relationship, which used to be a great predictor of yields, suddenly broke post COVID, <laughs> right? And actually a lot of interesting relationships have largely broke post COVID, you can argue. So I, 
I think it makes it hard to really have uh, uh, a sense of where things are when you can't rely on what's worked before, right? Now, maybe you can't rely on what's worked before as an indicator because you're still in this weird lag window where, again, all these things are still reverberating. You know, you got to remember four or five years in the context of history is nothing. Right. And that's only how far we are removed from, from COVID and all these monumental dynamics that took place. Um, but I think it makes it hard for a lot of, you know, more traditional fundamental analysts, more traditional economists to really get a handle on things. I mean, listen, I've been saying for, 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 you know, almost a year now, gold is sending a warning, not because I'm trying to be dramatic. <laughs> okay. But because factually gold tends to move in advance of tail events. It's not my opinion. You can, you can back test that. You can prove that you've had no tail events. You've had no risk, right? And you have not, not had other than the carry trade momentarily, and these junctures where it looks like World War Seven or Eight or Nine is going to start between <laughs> Israel and Iran, right? Gold's movement hasn't really meant anything as a signal, at least not yet, right? Whereas historically it has, right? So the question becomes: Do you abandon, you know, the historical, you know, cause and effect, the messaging, the signaling effect of these indicators because they aren't working now? Or if you do that, are you doing that at the exact wrong time when it's about to matter again? I don't know the answer. All I know is that it's very hard to really get a handle on where things are going here. Do individual charts, like stock charts, still work? And, you know, because other things are not working. The, the predictors, like you said, gold is a predictor of negative events uh, or, or slowdowns. But are, are the stock charts still working? Again, depends on, on who you ask, <laughs> if, if they're profiting from it. I mean, you know, the thing about charts is that if you actually backtest what people reference when it comes to charts, none of this stuff has predictive power. It's just... It's it's the mind needs a narrative, it needs a reason, and a chart is an easy way to give a reason to buy or sell, even though there may not be any predictive power at all. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's like, look, momentum is still obviously very real as a phenomenon, right? I mean, right. The, the argument that past performance is not in, is not indicative of future results, which we all have to say in the industry, momentum is past performance it being indicative of future future results. So trend following uh, from that standpoint, you can argue works, but it's been very thematic and very concentrated in just a select number of companies and just a select number of themes. Most things I keep going back to have been chopping, right? At some point that changes, the charts have a breakout and maybe you have some persistence. Um, but it's like, tell me, show me any chartist that thought uh, suddenly China would be up 20% in, or whatever the number is in a week and a half. Right. It's like, you know, sometimes it has nothing to do with the chart. Sometimes it's just a matter of being there luckily at the right time. Let's talk about the debt for a minute. And what effect do you think that that's going to have? Because that's not getting any lower. And we're going to continue to service this debt, which means we're going to have to continue to print money to service this debt. And it's a, it's going to be a vicious cycle. So unless we stop spending, which neither one of these presidential candidates is going to do, because, you know, on one side, I hear seven and a half trillion added to it. On the other side, there's all kinds of infrastructure spending. So, you know, how do we get a handle on it? The way to do it is get Nancy Pelosi to, <laughs> to trade the entire government portfolio. Because uh, she will just, she'll, I'm just, obviously the profits will take care of the debt, uh, clearly. Um, I don't know. I mean, debt only matters when people care about it. I mean, let, right? it's like we talk about it, but nobody cares about it until it actually creates you know, some kind of a crisis. And you haven't had that yet, right? And, and and then it's a question of, okay, well, okay, so debt to GDP. What is the magic debt to GDP number where the so-called vigilantes kick back and say, you know, we're not going to pay government debt. And then if the so-called bond vigilantes say we're not going to uh, buy bonds, then the, the Fed will. And, you know, the, as long as the dollar is a reserve currency, as long as we have military bases all over the world, that dynamic's not going to change, right? So what's the... What's the debt to GDP where it becomes, you know, the real crisis point? That's the only question that matters. But who, that, who knows? That could be 200% for all we know. <laughs> it could be 300%. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, the one thing that I think you can say about the debt situation is that it further makes the point that no matter what, they need, they in quotes, the, the policymakers, they need negative real interest rates. Meaning they need inflation to be higher than the cost of capital to eat away at the interest expense from an inflationary perspective. Right. Right. So, which is why, which you can argue is maybe one of the reasons the Fed did lower rates, because they want to get back to negative real rates, right? If there's another wave of inflation and they keep rates where they are. So, uh, from that standpoint, it goes back to this point that they're going to keep on jamming, you know, money into the system. If that's gold bullish, that's, uh, you can argue, uh, non correlative assets bullish. Um, 
I think a lot of large part of the gold move is because of that government debt and the realization that they have to keep rates negative and gold does well when you're in a negative real rate environment. In sticking with that theme of markets, AI has been like the, the big, you know, thing. And it, is it as big as I, I, from a market standpoint, it seems to have died down. Uh, you know, obviously, NVIDIA isn't climbing the way it, it was, and other AI stocks have taken a hit, but it's now grown tentacles in, into other places. Are, are we still watching AI, or are we looking at the peripheral of the periphery of AI and you know what it can do for other things like energy, like you know stocks that not don't aren't don't build the chips, but they build the racks, they build the cooling system. So are we looking at all of those things? I mean, it hasn't mattered much from a market perspective recently, but it matters a lot from a marketing perspective, right? Because how many companies are now saying they're using AI and they're getting <laughs> subscriptions because people are like, oh, it's got AI. It's going to be better than it ever was. It's the same damn service, right? Um, and deliverables are all the same. I, I, The one thing I have confidence in is that the human mind is notoriously bad at estimating how long things take to play out. Right? It's like no different than construction. You do something construction-wise, there's an estimate that's going to take nine months, and suddenly it takes two years. <laughs> right? It's the same thing. The human mind, is, it, there's all kinds of studies on this. We're very bad at estimating time. So is AI the future? Sure. Is it going to happen as quickly as people think? I don't think so at all. All right? It's fine. You're still moving in that direction. Right. But we got to temper our expectations a bit, I think. So what sectors are we looking at that are, like, obviously utilities – energy, uh, powering AI, uh, you know, depending on who you ask, either, uh, you know, natural gas or natural power, where, whether it be wind or solar, where, where are we looking these days that, that is it interesting to you? Yeah, look, I think um, it's funny because I argued at the start of the year utilities would likely be the best performing sector, um, partially because of the defensive nature and partially also because of the AI play. Right, um, because of the electricity usage uh, demands. Um, I think energy broadly. I think commodities, the material sector broadly. Right. Again, I go back to that's a bit of a China play from that standpoint. Um, I think those are probably sleeper sectors that should start to outperform. Um, and I do think, in general, healthcare is probably due. And I say healthcare outside of GLP one plays primarily biotech type companies. And I think, because again, let's go back to if AI is real, nothing is more complex than the human body. So you would think that if AI is going to be this, this incredible, you know, driver of, of breakthroughs, it, it should apply mostly to, to health. Right. Um, so I think, I think those areas are probably the most powerful. If you're going to have some kind of recession or slowdown, consumer staples end up being the, the place to be from a defensive allocation perspective. I, again, I, I, I have been wrong on emerging markets for a while. I am hopeful that this is, you know, a turn for that as an investable play. Uh, because as long as we're in an environment where it's just large cap tech and that's the only thing that works like it has been, the truth is, yeah, if you're a retail investor, it's great for you. You're, you're making money. Those in the industry hate environment, an environment like this, right? Because you can't beat the S&P when it's the only game in town. You can't beat the NASDAQ when it's the only game in town. You can't raise assets when if it ain't broke, don't fix it with the S&P and the NASDAQ. And that's a story of tech. Commodities, they've been beaten down for a while. Is that because China was in such a such bad shape? Is, is China, does the Chinese economy drive the almost the, the commodity market? I think in the in the eyes of most investors, they are the, the marginal driver, right, of, of demand. Now, um, India is a part of that too, because they there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that, that needs to take place or many, many, many years for that country. Uh, but I think, you know, from a from a from like a, a Pavlovian response perspective, China rallies, commodities rally. <laughs> it's just the, the Fed, it's just the way it's been. <laughs> the way the algorithms love it. You know, it's just, that's how they respond to it. So, you know, we talked about energy. Do you see nuclear becoming a, a much bigger thing? You know, Microsoft just reactivated Three Mile Island, which is not far from where I grew up. So it, 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 it makes me nervous a little bit. But, you know, the world is using nuclear power. I know here in the United States, we try and shy away from it a little bit because of the nuclear waste and the dangers of it. But do you see nuclear power as being something that we get further into? I mean, I just hope Microsoft, you know, in, in that restart doesn't suddenly have a blue screen of death when it comes to, to nuclear. 
uh, because that would scare me, uh, given the history of how Windows operating systems work. <laughs> um, I've been bullish on nuclear for the last like two years. I've written about it extensively. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think the, the concerns are overblown from a lot of perspectives. It's actually among the safest forms of energy. When you look at aggregate statistics against coal, against a lot of other things as far as deaths uh, per unit of power, let's call it. Um, having said that, there's always going to be a stigma. All right. And these are very long tail type of dynamics when it comes to nuclear. I don't think you can possibly have an AI driven future without nuclear. You're not going to power this stuff with wind. You're not going to power this stuff with solar. So that is the bottleneck, right, to AI. It is the nuclear play. I think it's it's going to likely continue. As you know, it's a volatile. As you know, it's a relatively small part of the investment landscape. But I think it makes sense for most people to consider, you know, sizing it appropriately, somewhat of a position in anything uranium. Anthony Pompliano was out with a new book and joined Anthony Scaramucci on Speak Up. He talked about breaking the cycle of pessimism and shifting toward a path of optimism. He also spoke about how to handle risk and his view on a recession. Anthony also voiced his concerns over central bank digital currency and played devil's advocate on Bitcoin. What do you say to somebody who, I don't know, maybe they grew up in a family where everybody in the family sees the glass half empty. And so they're walking around in life where the glass is half empty to them because maybe they got born into a family like that, or maybe they're genetically dis predisposed to that. You know, uh, sometimes pessimism is also a survival mechanism, right? People worry about what, what could happen and they try to prevent it from happening. Um, but you, you don't, I, I, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I read your book, I interact with you, I see a congenital optimist. But what do you say to somebody that isn't? Break the cycle. You know, it reminds me of the story, uh, there's a uh, alcoholic father, and he has two kids, one's an alcoholic and one's not. And they go to the alcoholic son, and they say, why are you an alcoholic? And he says, because my father was. And then they go to the second son who doesn't drink, and they say, why don't you drink? And he says, because my father was an alcoholic. And so, you know, just because you grew up in a certain environment, just because uh, you were surrounded by certain people, uh, you can still love your family, but understand that you want a different path or, you know, you want to be the one to break the cycle. And that's true, I think, of pessimism, of poverty, of many things. Uh, but, you know, frankly, it takes somebody who's courageous. It takes somebody who is resilient. Uh, and it takes somebody who, you know, is okay trying to do things when the people they care about most probably are going to give them a hard time, make fun of them, you know, uh, tell them that they're being stupid or unrealistic. And so that's why it's so rare, right? I mean, how, how hard is it to, you know, be successful in life and then do it while the people you care about, you know, are basically teasing you or taunting you. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And so people who are in that situation, I don't envy, but I do think that, you know, it is possible. Um, it, it just takes somebody with the, uh, the courage to do it. So, so pump embedded in all that though, is, being able to take risk on the future, right? So, you know, I'm 24 years older than you. And so I'm on, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be this old fuddy duddy. You look 15 years younger than me. Well, there's a lot of Botox on my forehead and, and pomp. You could use a little bit of my, my hair tonic, which we'll talk about offline. Okay. I could, I could straighten that whole thing that's going on. You know, you don't want a five head pomp in life. Just remember that. Okay. You want to keep it at a four. <laughs> OK, just remember that. OK, we'll talk about it offline. But but yeah, I got a lot of tricks that way, Pump. You know that. But but my point is, is that you're this young man who sees the world as it could be. And you're willing to make investments towards that end. OK, you got the Bitcoin, I don't know, five, six years before I did. Um, what do you say to somebody that has a hard time with that? What do you say to somebody that is resistant to change or is resistant to investment, thematic change, um, uh, sees Apple, uses Apple every day, but can't bring themselves to buy Apple because it's a tech stock. Uh, they use uh, Microsoft's operating system every day at the office, but yet they don't own any of it uh, in their personal account. Or they see something like Bitcoin, this incredible technology that you and I both think are changing the world, on its way to changing the world. And they say, oh, you know, it's worthless, it's useless. What do, you, what do you say? How do you break them from that? Well, I think one is uh, you don't try to convince anyone of anything they don't want to do, right? You kind of get the results that you deserve. And so if you take action and you're right, you'll be rewarded. If you don't take action and you're wrong, then you'll get punished. And that's kind of how you know markets work in general. Uh, but also I think that um, the people who end up 
in my opinion, you know, being most successful investing, building, uh, and creating kind of their own version of what their extraordinary life is, are people who they never get mentally stuck in hardened concrete. They're constantly changing their mind. They're constantly looking for more information. They're constantly curious. And so, you know, we were having a conversation in the office recently where I explained to someone, hey, I read something in the news. I thought it was true for years. Uh, somebody told me that it wasn't. And so I went on this like fact finding mission. I went and I tried to read as much of the source material as I could. And I was blown away by what I read. And, you know, what ended up happening is the news was partially right. What the person had told me was partially right, um, but it forced me to go and learn for myself. And so I think that you know there, there's kind of two different types of people in the world. Um, th there's a, a a famous chess player, uh, Josh. Um, I think his name is w Wadesick, uh, who is thought yeah, to be Josh kind of the Wadesick, next Bobby yeah. Fischer, right? Yep. And he wrote this great book called The Art of Learning. Um, and in the book, he talks about something called entity intelligence and iterative intelligence. And the idea of entity intelligence is basically uh, your parents tell you you're winning chess games because you're smart. You're winning chess games because you are good at chess. You're winning chess games because you are a winner. But the problem is that when you lose, you then say to yourself, I'm a loser. I'm dumb, right? I'm not good at chess. And so he says those people end up not going very far in life because when they're met with adversity, they, they cave. Instead, the idea of iterative intelligence is when you're winning a chess game, your parents tell you uh, you're winning because you worked hard. You're winning because you put the effort in. You're winning because you you know practiced and, and you positioned yourself correctly and, and you did all this. So when you come to a loss, what you say to yourself is not, I'm dumb. You say, I need to work harder. I need to put more effort in. I need to be better prepared next time. And I think that in life, uh, you come to the iterative intelligence one of two ways. It's kind of nature versus nurture. You either are kind of born that way and you happen to be in the right environment, all that kind of stuff, or you got to work really, really hard to learn that. And both can work. Um, you just kind of kind of figure out like, do I have the entity intelligence or do I have the iterative intelligence? If I don't have iterative intelligence, I got to, I got to start working that way. Right. And the beauty is that with the internet and, you know, kind of all the access we have to information and people today, you can do that. Uh, but it goes back to this idea of agency. You know, how many people really think through, uh, do I want to change anything about my life? Do I want to improve anything about my life? And then have the discipline to go and act. Not very many people. And so I think that, you know, it's why we as a society celebrate or uh, kind of uh, look for these stories where people have had extreme economic and social mobility or, you know, radical change uh, with health transformations, et cetera. It's because it's so rare. And a lot of people want to have that. They just don't want to do the work to uh, to get there. Uh, recession coming? No, recessions have been outlawed. Um, we had a recession and they refused to acknowledge it. And so no matter how many recessions we have in the future, they're just going to print money, suppress interest rates, and a random fake nonprofit is going to determine whether it's actually called a recession or not. So um, uh, I'm out on uh, recessions uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay. So we, 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 we have a tendency to use the money to sugarcoat is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, which speaks to Bitcoin. Uh, let me be the bear for a second. Okay. And obviously I'm bull, but let me be the devil's advocate. I bought my Bitcoin in November of 2021, Pomp, and I paid $67,000 for it. It's three years later, and it's at 63000 So am I a bear? Am I feeling bad about myself? Or well, well I, of course, I didn't buy my Bitcoin then, so I'm actually feeling good about myself, but I want to be devil's advocate. I purchased it at the high in 21. So how should I be feeling about Bitcoin? I think there's a couple of things. One is if you made one lump size purchase, you know, if you want to see the kind of uh, optimistic perspective, Bitcoin stored value for you better than the U.S. dollar did, right? The dollar has been eroded more than even Bitcoin's price um, over those years. Uh, two, I think, is if you dollar cost averaged into Bitcoin uh, and you started buying right at the top of the last bull market, and you dollar cost averaged all the way through the bear market till today, you're up significantly. And so, you know, that lump size purchase versus a dollar cost average obviously has different results. Uh, but more importantly is, you know, I think of Bitcoin as a savings account, right? I, you know, I, one of the things I tell people now is like, you got a checking account and a savings account. I think Bitcoin is your savings account. I think that these stable coins or digital dollars are going to be your checking account. You're going to want to spend the dollars. You're going to want to save the Bitcoin. And so, sure, it's nice when Bitcoin goes up in dollar terms, but I very much think of Bitcoin today as 20 years from now, will it be at least worth what it is today in purchasing power terms, if not more? 
And if it accomplishes that, it'd probably be one of the only assets that uh, will do that. And, you know, there's even been periods over the last five years where gold has lagged inflation. And so I do think that there's this very interesting dynamic of uh, the promise of Bitcoin being the protection of your purchasing power. Now, that doesn't help when you look at your you know, brokerage account or your Coinbase account. You see that the dollar uh, price is down. Um, but you know, let's see what happens. 90 days from now, it might be a completely different story. What's your take on the impact of CBDCs on the future of decentralized currency? That's Alex from Australia. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, CBDCs, I am uh, not a fan of. Very, uh, very scary to me. People have obviously talked at nauseum about the surveillance of uh, these assets. Uh, I'm more worried about things like personalized monetary policy. You know, everything in our life is personalized. And so how Google Maps directs your route, the music you listen to, your Google searches, all that stuff is personalized. If they have the ability to personalize monetary policy and the fact that, you know, maybe uh, Anthony Scaramucci's inflation rate is set at 2%, but mine is set at 4 or uh, maybe there is some degree of uh, devaluation. Or there is, you know, other aspects of personalization. I think that that, uh, while they may see it as economic solutions for problems, uh, mm -hmm. I think of it as uh, kind of opening a can of worms that could be quite uh, scary. Ram Alawalia, founder and CEO of Lumita Wealth, joined Wealthy on this week and explained how to differentiate between value and growth stocks. He also explained how rate cuts are affecting the baby boomers' investment decisions. He believes agency bonds, mortgage bonds, and private credit present an opportunity and are mispriced. He also touched on why Microsoft is investing in nuclear power. I want to ask about that value stocks versus growth stock. How do you differentiate between the two? Sure. It's an excellent question. So when I think about growth stocks, I think of stocks that on average uh, are 50% uh, plus in terms versus their median PE ratio for that category. Okay. So if you're a high multiple stock, simply put your growth stock. If you're a low multiple stock, your value stock. It's a very simple, clean distinction to make. You know, growth stocks tend to have higher earnings per share growth than value stocks and investors pay for that earnings per share growth in the form of a higher multiple. That's right. Right where we want it. It's like, look, you know what? We're not, we're not going crazy. We're not going down. We're just you know, steady ship. Arguably, we were right where we wanted to be before the rate cuts, <laughs> right? So yeah. now we're adding some gas and fuel to the fire. And over the last year and a half, we've really developed this boomer economy where we've got retirees living off of T-bills uh, and they're spending. You know, if you go to your local restaurant, the restaurants are packed. Restaurant stocks are, are quite expensive. Uh, and you can usually spot like a, a grandma or grandpa around the table and they're probably paying the bill. <laughs> so now with rate cuts uh, and uh, treasuries paying less, that means less income for boomers. All right. So that means for retirees, especially. And that means you're going to see a shift in spending behavior and risk taking behavior. And so you're starting to see dividend paying stocks that are going up. So grandma, grandpa now being forced to rotate from treasuries into equity markets, which have a lot more risk where you're at the top decile of valuations now. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if that's the right move because the economy, you know, uh, adjusts to the prevailing set of circumstances. So when you suddenly change one variable, and the economy needs to go through this adjustment process again. So the, the shift, do you, are you seeing a shift in some of those things where, you know, the older people are taking money from one place and putting it in, a, in another to, I, I guess, keep that we'll dividend? See, we'll see. I, I, it's too early to say. I hypothesize that we're going to go see that. So you might measure it in travel and leisure spend and demand for like cruise, of course, restaurants. Uh, consumption of golf clubs at Dick's Sporting Goods. So probably a few ways you might measure it. Or, you know, you've seen weakness in, uh, say, stocks like Hilton Garden Vacations and like timeshare companies. So you're seeing some weakness there. Uh, but uh, I expect that it'll continue. Look, this will benefit borrowers, of course. Uh, and it's going to penalize savers and creditors. So borrowers will be able to benefit. You're seeing... Uh, you saw, I should say, a boom in mortgage refinancings uh, from homeowners that took out a mortgage at a higher rate. However, 
Now mortgage rates have crept back up due to the 10 year moving up and concerns around inflation. So the Fed right now has got to be smacking themselves on the forehead and saying, what the hell? <laughs> right? They, they squeezed here and then something gave there. And in a way, it's offset of what the Fed is looking to accomplish because the long end of the yield curve is what funds the housing market, right? Access to mortgage credit. It funds capex spending of corporates. Uh, it funds and is used to compare the earnings premium and yield that you have in the equity market versus the alternative, which is a 10 year uh, bond of comparable duration. So the Fed is the Fed is confused. I legitimately think they're not sure the right way to move with high conviction. I mean, how can you? This is a complex story that a lot of moving parts with a set of circumstances that we haven't seen before, where consumers refinance at very low mortgage rates. And so the sensitivity to interest rates was also lower. But balance is the key. It's you want to have a little bit of everything in there. Would you throw bonds into that into that portfolio as well? Well, let's say what kind which bonds? I would put mortgage bonds in that. I think agency mortgage bonds are once again mispriced. I would own agency mortgage bonds because an agency mortgage bond is implicitly backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. However, they offer a yield that is substantially higher than the comparable treasury to the tune of 250 basis points, which is a nothing. So agency mortgage bonds, I think a really interesting idea. Uh, that's one. Uh, treasuries, I'm not a big fan of. Uh, you know, you can give away two and a half points of a 4% coupon on the 10 year in inflation. Uh, I also see that private credit strategies can dramatically outperform treasury yields, right? You can get 10% to 18%, depending on the nature of the strategy in private credit, for example, through funds that provide senior secured lending to middle market companies that have free cash from earnings, but can't get a loan from a bank. So senior secured means you're first to get paid in line, right? So you're on the top of what's called the capital stack. There's also strategies where you have asset back financing. You're making a loan and you've got collateral. So I like those strategies. Why would I own treasury at <laughs> right. if I can invest in that? Now the answer would be liquidity. So those strategies don't give you liquidity. So Microsoft is going the nuclear route. Do you see a nuclear play at some point? There's a lot of talk about uranium, mini reactors, powering mm -hmm. things. Do you see, in, in, and it may yeah. not be tomorrow, it may not be you know, in, in a few months, but eventually we're gonna have to turn to that. Yes, yes, it's inevitable, it's happening. Uh, two years ago, it was unthinkable. Now it's inevitable and popular and Congress is starting to focus on it. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is starting to focus on it. You know, the United States forgot how to build nuclear reactors. We have something like 80 plus nuclear reactors in the United States, by the way. Haven't built them in decades, but we have a bunch of them. And the United States forgot to build them. South Africa knows how to build them. China is building a, many nuclear reactors. So China has plenty of energy. And uh, so we have the GPU. China has the energy. We need the energy. China needs the GPU. So our race is on the energy side. Their race is on uh, de-linking their dependency on Taiwan and NVIDIA. And tr they're trying to you know, get around export controls. So yeah, nuclear will make a comeback. Building a plant takes like a decade though. It takes, you got permitting concerns, you got not in my backyard concerns, you have technology, know-how concerns. Uh, I think it's a great, it's a great thesis to bet on. It's a very difficult thesis to bet on, by the way. The vast majority of nuclear companies are unprofitable. I see people investing in stocks like SMR, which stands for small modular reactor. The small modular reactor is actually a really good idea. We're going to see that too. You're going to see small modular reactors, not big three mile island reactors that are right next to the data center. Uh, but some of these companies like the small modular reactor, last I checked, like the CEO sold all his shares, like the insiders are sold out. It's just trading like a meme stock. So you have to carefully pick and choose uh, your spots in the nuclear category. And many of nuclear names are unprofitable. They don't make money. And then the nuclear miners, they can be upside down because they make forward commitments to sell uranium at a future price. But if they cannot deliver, 
and mine enough, which many miners are experiencing that issue, then they're technically short uranium. So you thought you're buying a uranium miner so that you get long uranium exposure indirectly. And it turns out the miner is actually short because they made a commitment to deliver in the future. They cannot meet. So they have to go buy in the spot <laughs> market, right? So uranium is a, is a difficult category to invest in. I do think there are good opportunities there. Thank you for watching this week's recap. If you need help planning your financial future, head over to Wealthion.com slash free for a free, no obligation financial review. And please follow us on social media. All the links are below in the description. If you haven't already done so, please make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss a video. Thanks again for watching. If you like this content and are looking for more ways to keep growing your investments, watch this video next. Until next time, stay informed, be empowered, and may your investments flourish.